I'm Doug Schwenk, CEO of Digital Asset Research. It's my pleasure to be joined today by Jeremy Schwartz from Wisdom Tree and Sergey Nazarov from Chainlink. We're going to have an exciting dialogue about the future of finance and how blockchain technology will impact where we go tomorrow. Great. Thank you, Doug. Uh, great to be here. Very excited to have this conversation with you and Jeremy. I think it's going to be very interesting. Um, I think there's a lot of stuff that's developing in the capital markets and the real world asset tokenization and the fund space that's all intersecting in a super important, useful way. Very excited to discuss it and, and really looking forward to, um, to talking through the, the details. So I'm Jeremy Schwartz, Global CIO at Wisdom Tree. Uh, I've been with us for about 20 years. Uh, I've seen us grow from startup ETF manager to have 110 billion in assets and increasingly spending more time about this next generation wrapper of tokenized funds and taking things from ETS towards this new future. So it's exciting to talk about what we're building with you both, Doug and Surya. Great to see you both. Jeremy, let's uh, start with you. Tell us about Wisdom Tree and your role in the organization. What is it that you focus on and, and do and how does that cross into digital? So I oversee the investment function across across the firm, and we have equities, fixed income, commodities, crypto. And so we're building various exposures, um, including model portfolios that combine all these things together. And so I think about that for a traditional business and ETFs and ETPs in Europe, but also now token and, and how do we implement it on the blockchain. And so it, it's really just trying to create the best exposures that we want to deliver in the various wrappers. Increasingly, we're thinking more and more about the tokenized wrapper of, of putting it all together. What's driving your organization and other asset managers to adopt blockchain technology? You know, I think it started, you know, our CEO had this strategy group. We talked through, you know, what, what could do to the ETF, that what we did to the mutual fund. You think about sort of disruptive technologies. There's always this question looking around the corner, what's next? Is there any threat to the ETF? Uh, it's been really the best wrapper and vehicle to get exposure, you know, for the last two decades. And they're getting more and more share. And we still think the ETFs are going to be with us for a very long time and have a lot of huge benefits compared to the old school fund format. But we do see the blockchain is adding a lot of key functionalities that is quite disruptive. Um, you know, we, the regulations have to catch up. There's some things about the tax efficiency of ETFs that still have, I'd say, some benefits in traditional equities. But there is a utility you can add to assets through the blockchain uh, things like fixed income and payments and how you earn off assets uh, that I do think is very transformational. Um, and we think about, you know, just even think about Bitcoin, the biggest crypto asset and how it's being used. It's really forcing the banking system in a way to be way more competitive. You think about the old rails, you, you're doing nine to five, Monday to Friday versus getting instant settlement, 365 um, every day, no closed hours. It's forcing our bases to be more competitive. And so uh, that itself has a very huge utility. Now, will everybody use Bitcoin as money is one big question. Um, but the functionality itself, the technology itself is, is a key development. And that's what we're striving for as we're trying to build, again, these future rails of finance, putting different wrappers through the tokenized. And there's no reason why you can't do what Bitcoin is doing for money uh, in, in many more ways. So that's you know, it's really just the promises of the technology to um, provide more utility across your assets. Sergey, you've been in this industry for quite some time and have, have had a lot of experiences. Um, what is Chainlink's role in bringing global markets on chain? Yeah, sure. So my view is that kind of cutting edge places like Wisdom Tree are going to be bringing all of these assets on chain in various forms and various steps. And I know that Wisdom Tree has been pushing the limits of what you can legally do in these, in these ways that is really quite innovative. So Chainlink's role is not so much on the legal side or the creation of, of financial products. It's in providing technology that once a on-chain financial product can come into existence, like a tokenized fund, for example, or even for some of the products that are not tokenized, we provide certain levels of proof about them. So Chainlink is an infrastructure that proves and transmits and connects various key pieces of data and value so that these very advanced financial products that people like Wisdom Tree are making 
can um, go on chain in useful technical ways, right? So my interactions have been with both large financial market infrastructures and market infrastructure systems like SWIFT. Uh, recently, we released something with the DTC, uh, DTCC about SmartNav for the tokenization of funds. So what, what I'm mostly involved in is not the actual creation of the financial product. It's supporting the people technically that make that financial product possible. If that if that makes sense, if I could just add to that, I mean, I love what what Sergio just said. I mean, the DTCC uh, acquired a firm called Securency that we have been working with closely. Uh, we were a large investor in Securency in in the past before it got acquired by DTCC, and they, you know, that is part of the tokenization functionality using some of that technology. But his key words that he said to start going through the regulators, you know, it, getting through, not trying to go around the regulators, but getting funds approved um, in an official way is, is our ethos. And we're going right through the front door of the SEC. And if people in, in crypto often will get annoyed at the SEC from, you know, have they created the ETFs or do they take too long to create the Bitcoin and other ETFs? And we could all talk about all that. But, the, you know, for our funds, they they did show that they approved, you know, we were able to launch these funds uh, and that wrapper. Now the question is, can the rest of the market make community I mean, you catch up in some ways, right? You know, they, they got to be able to prove to trade securities um, versus the traditional tokens that they've been trading. But getting through the front doors of the regulators is definitely our ethos on this. Jeremy, just kind of piggybacking on that uh, idea, um, what are your current initiatives in the digital asset space? ETPs, ETFs, how do you see? The uh, the Ethereum uh, ETF in the U.S. Uh, uh, rolling out is that something that is interesting uh, to Wisdom Tree? Do you have other initiatives you're working on in Europe? Um, what 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 sort of initiatives are interesting to to you and um, and Wisdom Tree? Yeah, I, I'll, I'll briefly talk on the ETFs. And we launched ETFs or ETPs in Europe. A number of years ago, uh, and we've been one of the the leading providers in Europe. Uh, we're seeing healthy flows there. We have a little bit under a billion dollars across the platform, but from Bitcoin, Ether, um, there's a whole suite of them from combined assets, a a mega cap of Bitcoin and Ether, and all basket. So we we are trying to think very forward. Uh, and in Europe, they actually allowed more. In the U.S., we were one of the, the group that launched Bitcoin. It's, it's incredibly competitive. Um, and, you know, I, I'd say we, we we are not in the Ether race. I mean, we have an Ether product in Europe. We didn't decide to go after Ether. We do offer Ether in our Wisdom Tree Prime wallet. Uh, so this is what would actually, when we think about tokenization in the future for this, this foundation, as I talked about tokenizing funds, you've got to be today... Uh, a customer of Wisdom Tree Prime to get access to that. But we have 13 separate tokens and exposure in that wallet. Uh, this is where I talk about regula regulations. The securities groups have to catch up to be able to trade our tokens. Like right now, you can only trade the tokens in our wallet. We would love for these tokens to exist and trade outside of the wallet eventually. Uh, you need more people to be able to trade them and get regulated to trade securities tokens. But so that's one of the things where we're sort of helping the industry catch up, but they'll they'll eventually get there. Um, I'd say, so you could trade Bitcoin and Ether in the wallet, but you could trade treasuries. You could trade large cap equities, tech equities, gold, uh, model portfolios to, or sort of asset allocation from, you know, 60, 40 to 100 percent equities with Professor Siegel, who I've been working with for 23 years. His book stocks for long runs on my bookshelf that I co-authored with him. We have, you know, we have models, sort of Siegel models that gives his thinking of how to allocate in the wallet, which is a, a nice uh, I, I sort of set of exposures there. So, um, you know, we're working hard to make that, you know, so it's it's it early phases of the rollout, but it's definitely a strong use case. I personally moved all the cash I had at the bank into effectively or 90% of, of all my cash into the prime wallet and paying bills, paying my house payment, my car payment, my Amex payment, all my credit cards. And Soon, it's not quite there today, but soon you'll be able to pay that bill off of a treasury or a money market type fund. Like today, you still got to move it from treasuries to cash to pay the bill. You get an ACH number that you can then send out. 
but soon you'll be able to spend directly off the assets, which I think is a huge step forward for spending, merging spending and savings and investing and choosing how what you want to spend from. That's transformational. You want to spend off of gold in the future. Um, you can do that. And so I think that's going to be uh, the key functions that we're, we're adding to this wallet called Wisdom Tree Prime. For people's reference, when you talk about Wisdom Tree Prime as a wallet, can you put that in some layman's terms so that people can kind of wrap their heads around what that what that is? Yeah. When you go to the App Store, uh, Google or Android, you go download Wisdom Tree Prime. So it's a it's an app, and then in that app, uh, you get registered today. It's in uh, most of the states in the in the U.S. It's not a global function yet. We're working to keep getting all the states and make it eventually you know broader than just the U.S. Of course, uh, as I talk about, you got to get the regulations to catch up, but we're We've got a very healthy portion. I want to say three quarters of the U.S. by population covered, and you know we keep working on adding more and more states. Um, and but then this is where once you get that app in the wallet, you can then buy the tokens, and you'll get your basically ACH number that you can use to pay the bills. Sergey, you talked a little bit about working with DTCC and um, uh the project that you have going there. Can you give us a bit more um, on that project? And um, as a second question, tokenization of funds, is that, uh, what's what's Chainlink's role in that and, and how is that going? So I think the types of applications that Wisdom Tree is making are really on the cutting edge in terms of what they allow consumers to do. And some of the ideas that Jeremy mentioned about people being able to spend off of various on-chain assets that aren't cash is like a really innovative big shift in how the world works. Uh, I think that's going to take a lot of different steps, both from a legal point of view and an infrastructure point of view and an application financial product point of view. It's going to require steps in all three of those categories. The thing that we worked on with the DTCC was a step in the direction of putting more of those assets on chain because the on chain assets require data. So, DeFi, uh, for example, didn't really grow until you put data on chain because DeFi is a collection of financial products that don't function with data. Similarly, in like Web 1.0, when Reuters and Bloomberg and those companies were emerging, you needed data in order to make financial products work at all. So, data and financial products and their emergence have a very tight relationship, basically. So the dynamic that we have with DeFi is that when Chainlink launched, uh, we were able to help grow the industry from sub 100 million to over 200 billion by powering the majority of DeFi and putting billions of data points on chain. Now we're kind of in a world where the fund uh, tokenization, the fund industry is starting to interact with the concept of tokens through their existing legal structures, not by making on-chain tokens yet. But tokenized funds will be the on-chain tokens that funds make, in my opinion. And to make those on-chain tokens, they will require data, similarly to how DeFi required data. And Chainlink is the source of that data. The second thing they will require is connectivity across chains so that value can flow from a purchaser's chain to the chain in which the token was generated by the fund. So fund tokenization is when the activities of an, of an organization like Wisdom Tree go even more on chain, right? Right now, I feel like we're in an interim stage where the current legal structures are packaging tokens that aren't generated by Wisdom Tree from elsewhere into the legal structures that Wisdom Tree is very good and innovative at creating around tokens in other places. Eventually, I think we'll arrive in a world where firms like Wisdom Tree generate their own tokens by tokenizing their funds and their fund products and putting those on chain. And then we are the infrastructure provider that enables that to happen by providing the data, connectivity, some of the smart contract templates. Um, you know, We have a whole bunch of different tools that basically allow that to happen. And in order for that to happen for the more serious entities like Wisdom Tree, there needs to be legal approvals, which is what Jeremy just described. So I think I think we're in a place where you have the early versions of large legitimate entities like Wisdom Tree interacting with, with tokens, and we're going to go to the middle stage. And the middle stage is where there will be even more assets on chain. And then the final stage 
in my opinion, I don't know what Jeremy's views are, but my opinion is that most of the activity of, of a wealth manager or an asset management firm will eventually live on chain. And then as more and more of those activities migrate on chain, they'll need more and more infrastructure provided by something like Chainlink, possibly in partnership with someone like DTCC, because the DTCC is a good source of data and a good source of various resources that allow people to create these, these funds. But that's kind of the direction that I think everything is moving in. And our work with the DTCC is moving that forward on an infrastructure level. And Jeremy and Wisdom Tree's work, I think, is moving it forward on an application and legal level. And both of those things eventually need to connect in, in, in a set of products that are scalable and possible from an infrastructure point of view and that are usable and legally acceptable from an application point of view. Sergey, do you have an opinion about whether those um, on-chain assets, if you will, will be uh, permissioned uh, blockchain or or public? I think it'll be both. I think the cost of generating your own blockchain is continuing to go lower and lower. As the cost continues to go lower and lower, more and more people will launch their own chains, just like they have their own databases. At the moment, launching into public chains often involves launching your own L2 anyway. That's the scalability model they've adopted. But even if you're not launching your own L2 and you launch into a public chain, you're doing it because that's technically easier to do. So as the technical complexity of having your own chain, whether it's an, as an L2 within a family of chains or whether it's as your own L1 chain, um, more and more people will launch those, in my opinion, right? Because right now the cost and complexity has reduced by orders of magnitude from what it was in like 2014. And it's reduced, you know, even more from there to 2017, now 17 to 21. And now I think we're in a period where the launching of a chain is becoming pretty productized and pretty, pretty simple in terms of how does a tech team launch a chain. The piece that's missing is the ability to connect all the chains, right? To get all the chains interacting with each other so that liquidity can move across those chains. And that's what CCIP uh, does, right? So CCIP is the cross-chain interoperability protocol. That Chainlink has said the Chainlink community built. That's something that we're collaborating on uh, with Swift and 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 other large kind of participants in the market. And so that is the um, the way that we're putting putting forward as a global standard for how all of this liquidity and usage can go across chains. Jeremy, does uh, Wisdom Tree have a view on public versus uh, permissioned uh, blockchain? Well, I love what I was just hearing from Sergey about the cross chain. Promotions, you know, I, I think the, you know, we started our first efforts on Stellar. You know, we are eating the gas fees for the transaction. So, like the part of it was ease, speed, cost to manage our first set. Um, but certainly, we've also in our prospectuses said we're also going to make things available through EVM compatible chains, and and I think that's sort of on where things are going for us. Um, but you know, the key when we think about what chains to build on is really distribution and access in the network. So like, you know, to where Sergey was talking about, like if you build your own chain and as a startup, well, you don't have any distribution or network yet, right? Like when we're building Wisdom Tree Prime, we got to build it customer by customer one at a time. Uh, and now ideally you find ways to make it go uh, bigger, faster, um, but to the extent that you could get an installed user base and network effects of these existing in place public blockchains, I mean, that's partly how we think that, you know, now can you, is there benefits to a permission where you know the customer? For sure, there will be institutional use cases where that's useful. We we joined sort of the one of the the, the test nets with, with, uh, Wellington, T Row, and a few others to try try out some use cases in some of these permission settings. Uh, but you know, I, I think we're starting on the public, and we'll again, it's all about cost and distribution. At the end of the day, you got to find, you got to be able to connect to customers. Just because you can mint something doesn't mean you have any customers show up. So you need to be able to have a user base, and then you got for us, you got to do it very compliantly. You got to have the people who can trade these tokens, and so it's all. An ecosystem, but you know we're, we're hoping to push this ecosystem forward as fast as the regulators will allow. You mentioned Stellar as the starting point and and uh, sort of ecosystem and and users. Any other 
um, chains or uh, that you're looking at or considerations that you have as you think about um, what platforms you'll use to uh, deploy tokenized funds? Well, right now in our prospectus documents, it talks about Stellar and Ethereum. And then, you know, so I, until the prospectus documents change, I, we can't tease out any future stuff. But yeah, obviously, we're going to be looking at, at making them go and go in other places. Do you think it's uh, the future is a multi-chain world or do you think there's consolidation and we end up on a small number of chains? It's so early for, I mean, it's super, super early. It's hard to predict exactly how things will play out, but I, I you know, there's always a, the large get larger effect that happens. Um, but I think what Sergey is talking about with Chainlink of trying to do these cross compatibility and have things poured over across chains makes a lot of sense to me. So I think you can see things spread out um, and, you know, just have to see the use cases for each chain over time. Technology adoption is never uh, predictable, uh, is it? Um, uh, Sergey, um, what are the biggest challenges for financial institutions entering the tokenized asset uh, space? I think everyone is kind of on a different part of their spectrum of, of adoption and different levels of, of understanding and different levels of market demand. I think really the biggest challenge for all of them is getting political buy-in internally based on their building a sufficiently large market. And depending on the size of the firm, they're able to do that easier or maybe it's harder, right? So usually the smaller the firm, the easier it's for them to get political buy-in to actually do something. And the larger the firm, the bigger the market has to be, right? So as the market opportunity for real world assets, tokenized, anything grows, you're going to see bigger and bigger folks join more rapidly. That's, that's, that's the first big problem is, what is the market size? That's more of a political internal problem. Their, their second set of problems is really around how do they do this legally? So how do they generate financial products in a way that's compliant? That's a matter of uh, geography, right? So in some geographies, like in Singapore and Hong Kong and some other places, there's more clarity on how to do that. And in other geographies, there's less clarity, right? So it's kind of a difference between the clarity that that geography has created for its financial system. After you get past those two big hurdles, right, there's a market and I can participate in it legally, then we arrive at the technical questions of how do we do this technically, right? How do we generate a token? What chain do we do it on? How do we get liquidity from other chains? How do we interface with hundreds of chains? What is the data that needs to go on chain like NAV data to prove things about the fund? How much of the fund can we put on chain? Uh, and can that affect uh, fund administration costs and create various efficiencies can we do you know all these things? So the first uh, the first hurdle is something that I feel people cleared maybe three four years ago, where a few firms decided that there is a big enough market and they started doing things. The legal hurdle I think we cleared one or two years ago, depending on the firm, at least in some subcategories of products. And now because those two um, hurdles, the market hurdle and the legal hurdle, have been at least partly cleared. There's a large enough, there's kind of a critical mass of banks, asset managers, market infrastructures that all have digital asset teams, right? And so those digital asset teams um, are dedicated teams that have a dedicated PM, dedicated engineers, dedicated sometimes even managing directors. And those people um, have a mandate and their mandate is to implement tokenized products in various forms. Um, the amount of technical problems that those people face is often underestimated in my experience. I think there's a lot of ideas that blockchains can do all this stuff and smart contracts can do all this stuff and liquidity will just kind of flow into my product and it won't be a problem. And data will reach my product and it won't be a problem. And my product will synchronize with the SWIFT network or my product will synchronize with uh, CSD like the DGCC. Basically, what's happening is on a technical level, you're reinventing the whole financial system, everything, right? Down from the lowest infrastructure to the middle office systems to the front end, right? Like you're, you're reinventing the whole financial life cycle of everything. That means you need to make the low level infrastructure work. That means you need to make the back office processes work. That means you need to make the applications function against those new systems. This is an immense amount of work. 
And this is something that only happens once every maybe 50 years. The last time this happened was when the paper world went to the database world, right? So when the paper record keeping world of like the 70s had a paper crisis, they called it the paper crisis, and they and they transitioned literally to the DTCC as a storer of database records so that settlement for transactions can happen, not in a paper-based way, right? This is actually the origin of the DTCC. And so now what you're seeing is a migration of all of this value and all of these records and all of these transactions into the blockchain format. And then around all of that, there is a lot of data, connectivity, integration with existing systems that needs to happen for all of that to work. So I think we're kind of at, at, the, um, at the threshold of having enough of the problems solved that people are technically implementing them which is something I'm very excited about because it's the technical implementation of these things, which 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 is the thing that I'm excited to work on. Jeremy, I put the same question to you. Wisdom Tree has been through um, tokenizing some asset classes and coming up with the Prime Wallet. What what are the biggest challenges for uh, financial institutions to uh, uh, to take that journey? Well, I love how Sergey started out when he said, you know, it. It's the political internal politics, and I think about just my my traditional space, the ETF world. You know, all the buzzwords today, some of these big active ETFs that are gaining popularity, it's conversions from mutual fund to ETFs, and it's like thirty years later, these firms have decided the ETF is real, you know, and so they finally have converted some of their mutual funds to ETFs, and there's still a few, you know, holdouts that they say all oh, these mutual funds are still what what matters. Um, you know, so it could take 30 years. Uh, hopefully it doesn't for, for some of them. It doesn't take them to realize the value of the tokenized world. But it, yeah, the technology adoption is not always easy. And and, and you think about what, I, what we're doing on payments compared to your traditional bank, okay? Now, the challenge for a traditional bank is the Fed, you know, in, with basically taking no risk, you get paid 5% plus today. But how many of you have a checking account that is not paying you 5%? There's trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars not earning the appropriate interest rate because the banks can't afford to pay people the appropriate interest rate. Now, people say people are lazy and they're not going to move to get the 5%. Well, I I challenge you. you. If you have a bank account not paying you 5% and you're in one of the states that Wisdom Tree Prime's approved in, you should go check it out. And over the coming months, you'll be able to spend off of money market funds, off of treasuries. If you don't want the 5%, you want to spend off of gold. It'll be transformative to the way a traditional bank account worked. Um, we're not a bank. We're for sure not a bank, but you can pay bills like you had a checking account in many different ways. Um, we have a debit card today. Um, that's you just like you go use any other debit card, but the ACH transfer is, I think also is how I'm paying my bills is through the ACH transfer. So I, I think the, there's that now that's like the consumer has to say, Hey, I'm, I'm tired of having my cash or nothing. Um, but then the firm, well, we've spent a good amount of money to try to get to where we are today. And that was sort of uncertain regulatory environment. Now. Now that you see how we sort of have given people, you know, you can see what you, what we've done. And so there'll be more and they'll see if now the second is easier than the first. And so there's a whole suite of funds and people will be able to see the template of how it got approved by the SEC. And you'll start seeing more and more tokenized funds is our view. But it, and, and, you know, when why we went, we, we've been 13 different funds is to be first. Is not a, is a unique opportunity in this space. You know, we were not first to ETFs. We came out in 2006 with ETFs um, after the first ETF came in '94. We're we we for as broad of a family as we have, we're certainly first, which is why we're doing a lot and we're doing it quickly. And um, and I say I think pushing pushing the industry forward. So in the Wisdom Tree Prime Wallet, there are 13 fund options. Yeah, so it goes from the, again, Bitcoin and Ether are your digital assets, but then, or crypto assets, and then we have a suite of treasuries from super short duration, uh, we'll, we'll, and our biggest ETF in the U.S. is called Floating Rate Treasuries, U.S. as far as the ETF, 
We also have a digital version that in, in the wall. That's where most of my money is at the moment. But then, you know, we have a money market fund, which the the constant stable dollar, you know, so right now, interestingly, you get a little bit more income off of the floating rate treasuries than you get in the floating rate stable. Now there's a little bit with the floating rate treasuries, you go up in price, you pay the distribution, you go up in price, pay the distribution. So it's a little bit different. So, but the spending people will probably buying utility from spending off the stable dollar, but they're still getting paid the 5% type yields in, in money market funds. Um, but then you can take duration. We have longer duration bonds. We have tips bonds. Um, so you can have really the whole treasury curve. And for me, I'm at, I'm allocating to these Siegel models because it has a basket of our asset allocation team is figuring out how, where do we want to be around the world? Um, so not just US S&P or sort of tech type NASDAQ like stocks, we, which we have those as single tokens, um, but really around the world using ETFs as the underlying, our model team is with Professor Siegel's insights, looking at where we want to allocate what factors and, you know, that's hard to do. I mean, I got to go buy 10 to 12 separate ETFs to do that in my Schwab account, but in you get the wrapper of the underlying ETFs and get global exposure. And so that's going to be my default way of adding to equities over time. So is it fair to say two crypto um, assets and the rest are tokenized real world assets? Yeah, from treasuries um, to equities, multi-asset. So sort of mainstream. You could say the, you know, the, the, the traditional, this is how people traditionally have allocated to stocks and bonds and gold commodities. Question for you both. And, and Sergey, let's start with you. Um, do you see all fund administrative uh, components moving fully on chain? Or do you think there'll be some that continue to be done off chain and, and some on chain? Um, or is it, is it going to be uh, a process? I think it'll be a mix of on-chain and off-chain. So for example, the NAV work that we're continuing to, to work through, NAV has a few different steps um, to calculate it. And then there's another step to write it on-chain. And then there's the fund itself, the token contract or the fund contract that uses the NAV. So I think what, um, what the real question is, is will the fund uh, business become more automated? I think the answer to that is definitely yes. What percentage or what part of the fund administration goes on chain versus lives off chain in more automated systems like Oracle Networks is an open question. So for example, with NAV, we are now working on calculating NAV from the same data sources as NAV calculation agents on a second by second basis. So NAV against funds is often returned quarterly, monthly, weekly, all kinds of weird timeframes that make it very hard for people to transact in that asset because the value of it is not updated. You don't know what the value of the thing is. The value of it was a month ago. So if the value might have changed, then what, how do you transact in this asset? It's much harder, right? Because you don't know what the value of it is. The NAV calculation is something that can be done by an Oracle network and then written on chain to be used by various other processes that are kind of then made um, automated. So I think that what blockchains will do is they will take really all financial products and make them increasingly automated to the point where they're hyper-automated. And then this will lead to very efficient creation of funds and very efficient what's called in the fund uh, uh, management industry, asset management industry, mass personal personalization, right? So mass personalization is kind of, I think, the technical holy grail of the, the asset management industry where instead of a client coming to you and saying, hey, I'd like a fund that gives me exposure to carbon credits and cryptocurrencies and uh, municipal bonds in Southeast Asia, and that taking like many months or many complex steps, you basically have the cryptocurrencies on chain, you have the carbon credits on chain, you have the municipal bonds in Southeast Asia on chain, you have a bunch of templated contracts that allow them to be packaged together and administrated against an AV calculations, against a whole bunch of different steps. And then those steps technically are split between the on-chain code and the off-chain code that lives in an Oracle network. And that off-chain code can be connecting to liquidity sources like sources of payment. It can be the calculation input of NAV. It can be a number, all, all, all of these different steps. 
And then the legal structures um, of firms like Wisdom Tree, in my opinion, would manage and control and create and create certain legal guarantees around all that. And those legal guarantees would still be important to people. And those assets um, packaged in these, into these very personalized vehicles would, in my opinion, then be interacted with through these applications like the one that Jeremy described, right? So there's um, there's still some, some, some time to go to that. But my view is that the whole financial industry, the whole global financial system will become hyper-automated Hyper efficient and hyper interconnected for like atomic settlement, immediate settlement. And that will require a lot of data, a lot of connectivity, and a lot of integration with various systems and legal frameworks. So so that's kind of the part of the puzzle that we work on. But I, I think that's that's a project that's gonna take a number of years, but it's already well underway. It's already been happening for the last five to seven years. For example, we've been working with Swift for over seven years, right? So it's not like this project is starting now. You know, for Jeremy and Wisdom Tree to launch this app, I'm sure it took many years to figure that out and get it to a place where you can make that consumable by a consumer in a way that complies, right? So we're, we're at the point now where there's already a solid five to 10 years of real work to solve these problems. And I think we're kind of at this threshold where so many of the problems are getting solved and they're starting to interact with each other in really productive ways which is why something really interesting like Wisdom Tree Prime can exist. So it's kind of the proof is already there that things are starting to exist. Wisdom Tree Prime, how many years did you guys work on that before you got it to uh, uh, general availability? It's, it's trying to test my memory of like, when did it start? I mean, it's hard to remember exactly when it started. I it. it it certainly didn't happen overnight. So call it four or five years at least of of um, really doing it. We can go back to when we made our first investment in currency as part of the sort of tokenization platform to make that happen. That was acquired by DTCC as we talked about earlier. So it, we've been setting the foundation. We've been asking that question, what could do to ETFs? What well, we did in mutual funds. And so that is that the ethos of spirit of innovation and trying to think forward uh, but I fully agree with Sergey's worldview of there could be so much of this customization and, and the blockchain solves a lot of different issues. Um, and and there, that that instant settlement is a really interesting when we think about all the challenges that you've had and the things that I talked about, the banking system and how cryptos is really forcing the banking system to have more competition. We're forcing them from spending. Like, hey, they're not paying you any interest. You're earning zero. You earn 5% and spend from that. That's that's a huge monumental advantage. Um, but the instant settlement and other things has huge advantages. And there's and so it's all being able to trade. You want to, why do you have to stop trading? You know, crypto trades 24-7. You know, not everybody should be trading. Not to encourage over trading. A lot of the for you shouldn't be. It should be long-term asset allocation, that's what stocks are long run. It's not, hey, not, not meant to be a day trading book. It's it, we we but we do believe in it. But there's times where you do want to do things uh, not at nine to five or nine to four. So I think it's uh, there's so much benefits of this technology, and absolutely, we've been investing in it for a number of years. As long as you and I have been talking, you guys have been uh, focused on digital, which is uh, uh, quite a number of years. Um, Jeremy, what asset classes do you think stand to benefit the most from tokenization? Well, where we started, we started with the mainstream assets, you know, stocks and bonds. Um, I, I think the bonds personally were, the, were were kind of the most interesting given in where interest rates are um, and where the banks are, are, are letting people down. Um, so I think that is the most interesting to me, but you can... Over time, I mean, see, I, I was watching um, one of the TV shows and and saw them talk about tokenizing some rare art, and you're able to sell a piece of your art. I mean, that's a nice um, novelty item, um, but you know, as most of people's assets going to be there. I mean, so there's there's some of these things happening, um, but the mainstream assets, stocks, bonds are the biggest ones. Now, you know, real estate is another one people talk about. Private assets. We'll do more in private assets over time and try to bring that to a broader user base. I try that's an exciting thing to be investigating and how do, can we work with that ecosystem and 
and how do we develop our own capabilities there is definitely something we're thinking about. But we've started with the most mainstream assets it gets, you know, from treasuries, equities, multi-asset tools, um, commodities, those kind of things. Sergey, a uh, question to you. What are the benefits of programmable assets and how can they transform uh, capital markets? It's, it's actually pr pretty profound what, what can happen when there is something waiting to receive an instruction and you know exactly what it's going to execute. So right now there's a whole bunch of different systems in the financial system that people don't understand how they work. And it's very limited in terms of when you send some value or you send a request to do something, what can actually happen with that value or that request? We have a part of our system called programmable token transfers that we've already worked on together with large banks like ANZ Bank, which is a trillion asset under management bank. And what we were able to do was take a stable coin, wrap that stable coin in instructions. And then when that stable coin was sent across chains to reach its destination, it triggered a transaction namely the purchase of a carbon credit, right? So basically, you can codify the activities of um, the financial system into hundreds of thousands of little individual smart contracts that then get interconnected, they get composed to make bigger and more valuable and more useful smart contracts. That's kind of what we discussed about fund tokenization a little bit. <laughs> and then you just need a system that can trigger all of those conditions by sending value to them, right? So that's uh, kind of one of the missing pieces, in, in my opinion, what's one of the things that CCIP and its uh, programmable token transfer feature solves. But the ability to send value somewhere and then have that v value programmatically acted on, like I know I'm going to send this value with an instruction, that instruction is going to definitely 100% of the time result in this outcome of purchasing something or depositing or something, and that's cryptographically guaranteed is a very, very big change from how the world works today, where you're kind of sending value to places and then you hope that it, something happens. And then if it doesn't happen, you have all kinds of risk and you have all kinds of reconciliation and you have all kinds of problems, basically. In this world, not only can you send value somewhere and make sure that, and that something definitely happens, but that can happen in seconds rather than days or weeks as it happens in the current system. So I think the programmability of value, the programmability of financial products, and them being placed on hundreds or thousands of different chains that then people can all use to, to interact across you know, a huge amount of different financial product. And it actually won't be even thousands, it's going to be hundreds of thousands of chains. Um, that, that's really where everything is going because of these, these great superior features. I've often heard you, Sergey, talk about a world of smart contracts What's the like layman's um, way to to say that? Um, what what does the world look like in in the future? Part of the problem with people understanding blockchain and Bitcoin and all this type of stuff, blockchain technology and Bitcoins, is that it is not a consumer facing technology in and of itself. It enables a lot of consumer outcomes, like the tokenization of things. But it's, it's like trying for me to explain the value of a sink to you for washing your hands by explaining to you that a sink uses pipes, right? There are these things called pipes and pipes move water and they have, you know, they can turn around corners and pipes are made of various materials and the difference between pipes of this material and that and like all this stuff, right? The value to the user is the fact that they have a sink. They don't care about pipes, right? So I think the, 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 the real version of, of this answer is that the real kind of useful version of this answer is what is the consumer impact? I think the consumer impact you can view today through something like Wisdom Tree, Tree Prime, where you can see a few cryptocurrencies, but also tokenized real world assets. And then I think the list of assets that will be available on these types of applications will grow massively, right? So, so let's just quickly talk about what that would look like. It basically boils down to like three things. More fractional ownership of things that don't have fractional ownership. So you want to invest in a building in downtown New York City in the financial district. If you don't have a few hundred million dollars and you're not willing to engage in a loan negotiation process, you're not going to have anything to do with this building. But if I tokenize fractional ownership rights to this building, maybe you know I can buy a part of that building for a dollar. That's a big difference. 
then think about that for art, for various kinds of assets, for all these things that aren't really able to be owned today. That's that's the first one. The second one is really around the ability to own existing products, existing financial system products like treasuries, like money markets in a more secure, reliable, direct way, and then allow those assets to interact with other on-chain assets like lending protocols, you know, whatever else. One good example is let's say you own an on-chain asset and then you can spend against that because the on-chain system allows you to do that, which is something the off-chain system doesn't allow you to do. So it's creating various benefits and efficiencies around existing core financial products, like the ability to spend against your mutual fund holdings or something. Something like that is an example, really cool, interesting example, which would have a lot of um, practical applications for people. And then the third um, is really something people don't think about a lot, but it's like transaction times, transaction fees, transaction speeds, basically transactional efficiency, right? So if transactional efficiency reaches a certain level, you get a huge amount of benefits. Those benefits aren't super clear to you, but most of the time they boil down into cheaper fees, cheaper prices, better better prices for the assets you buy. These are things that the average person is purposefully abstracted away from by various financial firms and their technologies, right? So, but but the 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 final result for the consumer is all of these benefits, including better prices, better fee, lower fees, all these kinds of things. So there, there's a, and, and then there's like maybe a fourth category of benefits for the emerging markets where they don't have any of this. And now they can go, they can leapfrog from zero to one because you don't need a local financial system and you don't need a local legal system to participate in the global on-chain financial system, right? So if you're in Venezuela or Argentina or you know any number of other countries where the current financial system and legal system isn't giving you what you need, you can participate in the same quality of products as people in the developed uh, countries. And so this this is, uh, in my opinion, one of the things that will have the biggest impact on society globally is that just like telecommunications took people from having no landlines to having mobile phones, and the internet took them from having no books to reading the same Wikipedia page I read to get informed about things, um, it'll leapfrog them from no financial system to a highly reliable global financial system of immense quality, right? So it's it's all it's it's all going to have a huge impact on consumers. It'll just be a different impact in the developed and the emerging markets. Eventually, like most technologies, the impact in the emer- emerging markets will be world and life changing, and the impact in developed countries will be incrementally much better. Jeremy, we we are uh, getting close to wrapping this up here. Um, how do you see tokenization impacting uh, capital markets in the next uh, two years? I encourage the members of the capital markets to increasingly get registered to trade digital securities. Um, you know, because I think they've been avoiding that, and that's uh, that would certainly help this sort of tokenized ecosystem grow. There'd be new opportunities. Um, you know, with less less people focus on maybe there's more opportunities in these off hours transactions. So you want to try to expand in the trading from what you know what we had traditional hours today over time to these sort of more assets, but. Um, there's sort of shorter settlement time is going to be a, a key focus, as Sergey Sergey talked about. And um, you know, for us, I think we're focused on exactly how we started on the pipes analogy of in Prime. We're not talking about for a consumer. We're talking about a lot about the infrastructure here because this is focused on the industry. But for the consumer, you know, we're not leading with it. This is built on the blockchain. It is a great app to use to manage your money and get all these new functionalities. But it's not like a Hey, you're buying this because it's built on the blockchain. It's you're buying because of the benefits and the and the direct results. So, I think that's similar for just the whole capital works ecosystem. Is people will use it if they find utility, and as they see volume go there, the the traders are going to want to trade. So if 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 it does garner the interest that we all think it will, you'll get more market makers who will come into the market to make you deeper markets. We are um, at time. Any last uh, thoughts from uh, from either of you as we close out? It's been great. Okay. Great to be on with you, Sergey. Great to hear about all you're, that you're doing to do this cross-chain compatibility. Uh, it's exciting to see as this, this future evolves. It's been my pleasure. Really enjoyed our conversation. Really thoughtful um, kind of direction you folks are taking things. I think there's a lot of real potential in, in everything you're doing, and I'm, I'm excited about it. And it was great chatting with you. Thank you very much. Thank you.